So the first part of this, we'll have just a few minutes uh, as, as a panel. So I'm going to get our panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, Jane, I just noticed your picture at the bottom of my screen. I don't know where it is on, on your screen. But uh, Jane, introduce yourself. Not too long, just quick introduction, say hi. Hi, I'm Jane Brophy. I'm Vice Chair Comms of the Green Liberal Democrats, former MEP for the North West, and I'm currently a local councillor in Trafford and have been a local councillor for about 20 years. I also am just returning to the NHS. My professional field is I'm a diabetes dietitian, so very interested in all the food side of this. Thank you kindly. Uh, Simon? Oh, I've lost Simon. Where is he? Hello. <laughs> Simon, introduce yourself, if you would. Oh, right, okay. Um, yes, I'm Simon Oliver. I'm, what am I? I'm treasurer. Um, I've been a chair of a local society, a uh, local party, that is. Um, I have been chair of the Green, Green Lib Dems as well. Um, my professional life is all about software and software testing. And, um, yeah, been fascinated with solving the climate conundrum for many, many years. Okay, and Mary next. Hello. Um, essentially, I'm an entrepreneur, somebody who likes to get inside um, institutions, organisations, and change them from within. So I like problem solving, uh, you know, and the last job I've had was working in uh, manufacturing technology um, with a lot of the major uh, manufacturers, Jaguar Land Rover, Airbus, Rolls-Royce, uh, GKN, Dyson, uh, and a whole load of innovative entrepreneurs who were looking to recreate their products. So that background of technology, but it comes from being um, qualified as a broadcast journalist. Uh, so I'm a storyteller as well. So I get inside those organizations and help them affect change uh, with their products. But um, I've also been telling their stories outside other people and translating that economics. And that's some of the passion that drives me. And recently I've stepped out of that world and I'm standing to be mayor of Bristol um, as the Lib Dem candidate for the directly elected mayor of the city. Okay, thank you very much. And I'd like to go to Jason next. Hi, I'm Jason Billin. I'm vice chair organisation for Green Liberal Democrats. And for my sins, I've been party to organising this conference. Um, I live in the constituency and borough of Rushcliffe in South East Nottinghamshire. I was a parliamentary candidate in 2019 and I've stood in county and uh, borough elections. I'm currently the parliamentary spokesperson for Rushcliffe. My background is a lifetime spent in publishing. Um, I'm a originally children's book designer. I'm now a publisher and magazine designer and I have ha always had a passion for the environment. Um, I am a certified tree hugger. Um, I have been on bat counts. I have been on all kinds of different things. Um, and during the discussion with Jane at lunchtime, I was saying, yeah, for me, it's about if where we are at the moment, you know, I have learned from people who have, who have learned from people who have learned. If I do nothing with what I know, children in the next generation okay thank you very much jason uh, somebody's mics open and they're moving papers around which was a bit disturbing uh jed if you'd like to introduce yourself hi i'm jed marson i'm a johnny come lately to the lib dems um, i spent a lifetime starting businesses in next generation technology and uh, um, a lot of them have made huge differences for people. In 1998, I started a business that, um, because I'd been working at, at home um, since 1989, uh, a business to do voice over the internet, the sort of stuff that we're doing today. Um, not very possible without broadband, and I got involved in broadband and lobbying to get broadband to be as ubiquitous as water. 
and uh, was successful with the new local Conservative MP, of all things, um, uh, unbelievably chasing Sajid Javid and getting him to chase BT into giving Worcestershire uh, broadband as a ubiquitous product for everybody to be able to access. Um, now, um, I've walked away from the Conservatives after the 2016 um, debacle, and uh, I am a very active Lib Dem. I'm on the exec locally of our Lib Dem party, mm -hmm. and I joined the Lib Dems the second I walked up to the stand at the first conference I attended. Um, I'm somewhat useful with technology, and um, I like to look at things from the big picture. What can be made out of something that comes up as a new idea. Okay. I'm an old git as well, but you'll have to get used to old gits being around because we've got lots of experience, Keith. Well, speaking as an old git myself, um, I don't, can't argue with that at all, Jed. Okay, what I'm going to do next, um, and I would ask the people who haven't yet seen the film to bear with us, because I think this next little session might attract you into the thought of watching the film next week. I'd like to go through our panel again in the same order. So Jane, Simon, Mary, Jason and Jed, and that's for Karen's benefit, um, to see, to ask you a question. Don't take too long answering it. But what's the one thing that struck you most about the film and why? So just a little minute on that, Jane. Well, what struck me about the film is, in fact, it had a hopeful message for the future and an empowering message because in my professional life, in my political life, I've been about changing people and moving people towards a better place and enabling people to have more positive life. And actually moving towards the model of the green donor does enable more people on the planet to have a better, more rewarding, more fulfilling life. So whilst we're changing our behavior towards uh, lower carbon, better food, better communities, everything kind of points into one direction. And I think that's the key thing for me now is how we move people from where we are now, say A, and how we move them towards B, which is the better future. Okay, thank you. Simon, what was it that struck you most about the film? Um, I'm probably um, going to be in a minority here, but the thing, the thing that struck me most was how familiar it is um, because the, the structure and the concepts that he was talking about throughout the film just made me think of the transition movement and how you start with the vision. If you don't start with a vision, you don't know where you want to go. Um, and you, don't, you certainly don't know how to get there. Um, so Rob Hopkins, when he founded the transition movement, issued a, uh, printed a handbook or published a handbook which encouraged people to get together and create a vision of where they wanted to be in 5, 10, 15, 20 years time. And that's what this film is. It's a vision of where we want to be. Um, and I would like to see the whole party embrace this way of create, campaigning so that we are campaigning for a vision, not against things. That sounds like a cracking idea. Mary, what struck you about the film and why? Well, Simon set me up um, nicely on this in the fact that because I come from that packaging and branding background, you know, it, it strikes me that however cre creative human beings are, most of the time we evolve ideas and concepts. We don't revolutionize them. Um, so this film, like Simon's perspective, is not new to me, but the packaging is, the packaging of that message. And we're on the cusp of something quite momentous that almost is revolutionary at the moment in the times that we live, with the opportunities that the post-COVID world presents, uh, and then the uprising uh, with Black Lives Matter. Because that death of a black man in, uh, America by the hands of the police sparked something in so many people's feelings about actually it was relatable. It could be us, it could be me, or it could be my friend. Um, 
And here in Bristol, we had the pulling down of a statue, which actually was more revolution than evolution because people had started to say enough is enough. And your processes, your structures, your whole system is so stacked against change then we have to take action because you politicians have failed us and failed the system. And that is also comes on top of the fact that we had Greta Thunberg here in Bristol only a couple of months beforehand. And yet there wasn't that seismic change after her rally because people didn't quite get that relatable thing about why now, why act? Because it wasn't that imperative of actually this is going to kill me now. And bringing those two things together, if we get the new system right to say that Black Lives Matter, then actually we will end up getting that right for everyone else, for all of us, for women, for those with disabilities, those with it. We will create that new world, that post-COVID world, where accessibility is there and every individual has the means of production for, the, for their energy and accessible local food. Thank you. Jason, what struck you about the film and why did it strike you that way? I found it a unique inspirational model. Um, I, exactly what Mary has said, exactly what um, Simon has said, none of this is pie in the sky dreaming. It's just a what if it's, it's an alternative vision of the future we don't have to go down the model we we've already we're already on the path of all we have to do is do this and every single element of that film that he, that he was he was showing as he said apart from you know, the drone camera camera phone they exist it's a question of upscaling but it's a it's the that little message of hope because we are in a very dark time at the moment you know nationally internationally um and as, as we, even even without climate crisis, we're, we're in a dark hole. So just, just to be able to say, look, it can be better, yeah. rather than looking at the negative all the time, looking at a positive and saying, I, as Simon said, it's having that vision. It's it's what I loved about it is because I'm a very visual person. I'm, I'm a graphic designer. I'm a publishing designer, and I see things in three dimension, in full technicolor in my in my head. It's getting he's he's managed to get that vision that I've had in my head onto film animated and thinking yes that is what it can be like this is where we should be going you know and just simple things like looking down on, on a, a road interchange and it wasn't about taking the roads away it was about repurposing them mm. so you had footpaths going amongst green space that green space could be be planted talking about the fact that two-thirds of los angeles was car park and warehousing what are we going to do with that with that car parking space well simple thing is grow stuff on it you know, turn it into a natural space and grow things. You know, uh, I, I just found it a, a, a very uplifting, inspiring film. My worry is that, well, it's not my worry, it's the, my question that I'm going to put to everyone is, how do we sell, how do we get everybody else engaged with where we are now? Okay. Um, and uh, Jed, your, your vision from the film and what you, why, why did it catch your attention? I like the perspective, the third person approach that was taken. I have three daughters, so I have three times as many future generation daughters to worry about um, having a future at all. And I think a, a lot of the way that uh, my being <clears throat> now operates in the way that I look forward is to hanging about to make sure that this blue sky that we have today, which for many years I've said was the, the blue sky of my, my childhood, is something that we have to return to future generations. So um, I, I looked at it in the, the, the positive way. The, the, the Kate Raworth approach is, is human well-being. And I think that when we start to talk about collaborative commons, uh, we have to look at ways in which the 99% can monetize their collaborative common, whatever that happens to be. We need to find a way to decapitalize capital. For example, big agriculture is only 20% of the food that we eat. It's only 
80% of the food that we eat isn't made by big agriculture. So we're already in the majority of not necessarily choosing big ag agriculture's sugar. So we need to start to look at the facts and the facts are that 99% of us think the same way and think positively and think that we can do something forward for the future. So what would it be? Well, of course, in my, my, um, my mind, um, I, I watch something like that and think, hang on a minute, how could I monetize it? So um, seaweed licenses. So which bit of the coast could, uh, could we license and start to produce a variant of seaweed that will grow nearly an inch an hour? Um, that's one hell of a crop. Um, new growth in terms of uh, uh, one of the questions said, how do we clean the cars? I, I, I'm, I'm not going to say who that is um, because I, I noticed who said it, but um, how are we going to clean the autonomous cars at the moment? When I deliver a vehicle, because that's what I do um, to support my politics, I spend a day or two or three a week delivering vehicles. Um, there are two things that come to mind. The first is that when I choose my route, I don't know how well you can see this, but um, there's, there's a choice of, of route planning. I can go for the fastest route, the shortest route, or the most economical route. Change your sat-nav to most economical. So what can I do? So that makes my day longer, but that's the little bit that I do. When I clean cars, I worry and um, try to avoid the places where I see a car cleaned by somebody in the gig economy. And um, I can foresee from this movie that there's going to be something built into the cars so that they self-clean. So that's going to be yet another place for some good chemical to go into the atmosphere in that vehicle to clean it and um, some opportunity for somebody to make some robots to clean those cars. So um, my perspective is to try to look at who those, um, who those organizations are gonna be that clean them. So today, the people who rent cars from a Hertz enterprise, um, in my experience in the computer industry, there used to be wonderful name, like, names like DEC Burroughs, Hewlett-Packard, they all went bust. They all disappeared. They didn't get it. They didn't catch on quickly. So I think a lot of the time what we have to do as individuals is to say, I will do this because I can do it better, like Elon Musk does, but a European version that says, no, I, I'm not interested in you as an investor saying no or no. Um, I want you to look at the American way, which is to say, let's try and let's succeed with one of the hundred or so things that we try to make big and um, okay can i can well, i stop you there jed because uh, i want to try and get lots of discussion in and uh um you were you were answering all sorry, of the yes, questions i was running on <laughs> so um just just to apply the same discipline to everybody else in the room um i think before we go to everybody else in the room i think we probably need to try and explain donut economics um I noticed that Simon actually had a had a, a diagram. Uh, would you like to have a crack at explaining donut economics in um, about? He, he, can I jump in? Shall I share screen? Because I've got one on screen. Would that help? Yes. Um, <laughs> got no, I'm not sure that it would. Just at the okay, minute, just, let's I'm let Simon have a crack at describing it rather than showing right. everybody a complicated graphic. <laughs> Okay, I, I um, prefer to learn by seeing. Right. Uh, well, Thank okay, you. then. Uh, Thank, have you Jim. got the graphic easily to share, Jane? Jed is showing it. But I can the, share. I've got the uh, Wikipedia page open now, so here comes. I'm not sure okay. that's the best one of the graphics. Okay, but, well, it, um, it's, it's the one I've got anyway. Is it working? No, no, what, the one Jed was showing. Okay. Um, there's a better one earlier on. But um, I was just showing the book because I have not read the book um I sh i'll say i understand it because i've had a quick flick through and i already know some of the concepts um the concept of planetary boundaries for example where there are limits to how much resource we can take out of the natural world and use for our own benefit um there's various limits and the the outer ring of the donut is the planetary boundary um, the inner ring of the bound, uh, of the donut is the people who do not have enough resources of those uh, different kinds um, to live, 
and the donut itself is is the way we use our resources all the different um things we need as humans to live um could i come in on that on i then. think because um it's it struck me sort of having picked this up um that actually this is quite a liberal democrat way of looking at things um i hadn't come across the donut um uh, economic model i'd heard the phrase but i hadn't really come across it um, until we've had a little bit more discussion today and i've had a chance to look some stuff up but in the leadership debates that we've been having i've asked all three uh leadership uh, candidates um a question about um how much is is too much um you know, if we are going to tackle poverty and, you know, and this new times of, of the post-COVID world, the global citizens, should we be aiming for an international goal of a minimum income guarantee? That human life matters, that every life matters, and that no one should be without clean water, clean air, and a safe place to live. And because we, you know, we're so slow at taking on these big challenges and saying, actually, it's okay for some people to have billionaire lifestyles and they, you know, have their super yachts and have all of this at the expense of inherited wealth and advantage that they have gained because of inequalities built into the system that have enabled predominantly uh, white men to own and be within those structures, own the means of production, um, own the resources, uh, have access to voting. You know, if we look at, you know, women have only had access to vote for, for less than 100 years, some people. Uh, we've only had equal pay for 50 years, same, uh, you know, in the States. Um, the blacks have only had, uh, you know, we only had the Racial Equality Act in um, the bill in uh, 1964. So that amassing of economic finance that skews the system, which means you then have access to resources, the world's resources and the planet's resources, means that, you know, should we, we are scrapping people and we are saying that their lives do not matter and they're being thrown out uh, onto the streets and, and the scrap heap of life. And so that's the question I've sort of challenged all the, the leadership candidates with. And I think it's now that I've seen the donor economics, I'm beginning to understand that that's was what I was driving at, that we have all of this incredible technology, we have all of these resources, and yet this is so anti-liberal Democrat because all of those people who don't have this have got barriers. So they are not free to participate as a full member of society. And if you are not free, um, you know, that freedom concept of liberal Democrats, where we are, we are free to take part, to vote, to live the lives we choose, and we are free from barriers to participate, uh, whether it be poverty, uh, ignorance, or conformity um, means that we can never all be free. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the things about uh, my understanding of, of donut economics really is that the, the means of production, uh, the means of satisfying the needs of the whole population of the whole world must be done without causing uh, the pollution that we see so much of and the waste of resources that we uh, I've been talking about since 1971. The, 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 frustrating, the frustrating thing that I, perhaps Jed as a, another old git uh, can share with us is that feeling of wanting to have changed the world uh, for me 40 odd years ago. Uh, and really it hasn't changed that much. Having said that, uh, I do have an example of an interesting different way of repurposing. Um, I have got here a glass of water. And I thought just in case I run dry. Um, now, it, it, what it is, I'll have to hold this slightly differently. What it is, is a bottle. And somebody had the bright idea of cutting the bottom off the bottle, 
cutting the bottom off, sticking it on top and making a rather nice, this is a Grolsch beer bottle. Now, um, it isn't new. I've had this for ooh, at least 25 years, maybe a bit longer. So these ideas have been around. One of the problems is that we don't get to share these ideas as widely as we should. We get new populations coming through, reinventing wheels and so on and so forth. And yes, can I jump in there? Because I think what you and Mary have highlighted a really key point that came across to me in the film. Because part of my professional life is moving people from position A to position B. <coughs> what, what came across really clearly in the film that no one's mentioned so far is the fact that we're working with opposing forces. So it described how there are people out there, there's Trump and there's all those kind of negative messages, the, the carbon companies, Exxon, etc., that are building this momentum that is anti where we want to go. So it's kind of like, how do we change people as politicians, as activists, to go from where we are to where we want to be? Because like the glass you've held up is an idea that's nothing new. The things that Jed was talking about is nothing new. Simon talked about the same things. Mary's talked about the same things. As Green Liberal Democrat activists, nothing's really changed. The information is still the same. We know where we want to get to. We have that vision. It's how we start to move people to that vision. And we kind of need some leadership here, which is where perhaps Mary's point about the Liberal Democrats comes in. But it might not be political leaders. It might be people like Greta Thunberg, the new kind of leaders that are going to move the people who write the books. And for this to work, we've got to find a way of explaining it to people and moving people from where they are to where they were. Can I illustrate the point I was talking to Jason about at lunchtime? Because this comes into my behaviour change training that I do for the NHS is it's about the same with people moving towards healthy eating which was a massive part of the film towards low carbon lifestyles if you look at the analogy of a scarf and if you want if you hold if you hold a scarf between two people and you try and say right come towards me to this um small scale way of living the donut economics people will resist moving towards you won't they so we've got to find a way of loosening that scarf so that people come alongside us and walk with us rather than walk against us because otherwise we're creating this dichotomy of people not all walking in the same direction so i think as politicians and as activists we've got to find a way of moving towards people and getting people to walk alongside us because unless we do that it's going to become a two-way thing and, and mary talks a lot about women being empowered the film talked about girls and women's education i think there's a more kind of feminine way of looking at this but maybe maybe we can all change our way of thinking to start with ourselves and then we can start to change others okay right. thank, you very, thank you very much i'm um, i'm going to move where are we for time I'm, uh, we've got plenty of time but i would like to have i would like to have our first uh, tranche of... just before you do can i just put one challenge point in on on the film um, and you know this this may irritate people but that hopefully that will drive some good discussion um, feeling quite feminist over the over the point about girls education yes of course we do and yes it's been long accepted that the best contraceptive for women is education um, but if we only educate girls and we don't re-educate and change the language which we talk to boys and men in then we will never solve the challenges it's the same with the black lives matter it's the same with all of those ones where if you only look at the people who are being directly affected and the other people don't come along and stand beside you and say me too i am actually going to take it's very it's it's very martin luther king there's been a lot of stuff on at the moment you know, of that uh, and it's it's very sort of you know if you do not call out and challenge those positions of racism sexism inequality then actually you are tacitly becoming um indifferent and therefore you unfortunately yes you are part of the problem and you are responsible and it's quite a tough line. Thank yes, you. of course, but you can only do... Well, no, no, sorry, Jane. Before, before everybody continues, I'd like to ask Keith 
and each of the panel to maybe just um, share a little bit about um, Kate's diagram of donut economics, if people aren't quite sure. I just found this. I That's really usual, good. Karen, thank you. Would, would you like to just say a little bit about this? Yeah, the, the um, outer ring, the pink outside the donut, the, the donut is the green thing there that you can see. The, the pink outer ring are all the issues, uh, environmental issues, that can be um, made worse or made better by getting the donut in the right proportion. So we've got air pollution, we've got ozone layer depletion, we've got climate change, ocean acidification, chemical pollution, um, Nitrous, nitrogen and phosphorus loading, fresh water withdrawals, land conversion, biodiversity loss. The idea is that if we overshoot the donut, we then get into a problem. So the problem that has been most closely monitored for the last, um, uh, last little while in terms of politics is climate change. But there are all sorts of other things. Air pollution is one of the things that has become very noticeable by its change through the coronavirus period. Um, the fact that we're doing less travelling about and therefore not polluting the air as much has been very apparent. And uh, Jed's comment about blue skies of his youth uh, was very pertinent for me. So the outside of the donut is all the damage that we can do to the world um, and to ourselves by overusing the ecological uh, availability. So that's the overshoot, that's the outside of the donut. The inside of the donut is to do with social foundation. And one of the things I noticed uh, from uh, an internet comment probably a few weeks ago was that even the poorest people in this country even the poorest people in this country represent, if you take the whole of the population of this country, we are all within the top 10% of world richest people. That's including all the people who live in this country, or bar perhaps a very few who are actually on the street. Um, but all the people who live in this country are amongst the richest 10% of the population. So there's a lot of the population who don't have access to water, who don't have access to enough food. This is the inside of this donut. Health, education, income and work. Anybody who is less than uh, the inner circle, if you've got less energy or less networks or less housing or less gender equality, they are being deprived of the donut. They're in a shortfall. And the film was very good in its graphic representation because it, it, it sort of did it in three dimensions as well, which, which is very much what the donut is about. It's a three-dimensional thing rather than the circular economy, which is, which is not the same as a donut. So um, I hope that's helped a little bit in terms of understanding why the donut is called donut economics. Um, Can I add something? Oh, hello, Sorry. Steve. Yeah, I do hello. know you're coming this afternoon. Welcome back. I, I'm in the car now, look. <laughs> and I've pulled over. Um, the, 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 the thing before you get to donut economy, though, is actually looking at where the initial problem lies. And the problem we have at the moment is growth. And growth is the, is the real issue here because we've hit that ceiling already with GDP growth. And what Kate talks about in her video and, and you know, in her book is about how we thrive, not grow. And that, I think, is the fundamental point, first and foremost, before we get to the donut. And you're right, circular economy, and I, I had to explain this to one of the candidates this morning, is the circular economy is a great principle, but it will continue to grow. And eventually, a circular economy will grow bigger than its actual capability of the planet. That's, that's the difference. And that's the main difference we have to, um, to embrace is that currently, at the moment, the, the society, the economic setup is where the planet can cope with waste and the planet can cope with um, providing resources. And that is completely unsustainable. Until we change that fundamental measure of how we do our economies in the first world, that's, that's the key point. So we have to get rid of GDP. 
I think, as the growth measure and work on something else. And Joe Swinson mentioned it in conference last year. She said, we must measure our economy by well-being. And that's exactly what we need to be pushing. OK, thank you. Right. I'm going to exert Chairman's privilege now and move on, if I may, yeah. to a situation where we're calling in uh, the people in the room to speak. Um, so the next 10 minutes, I hope, will be taken up by five contributions or thereabouts from the floor. Um, you are perfectly entitled to say whatever you wish to say. Uh, I would prefer it's all about um, uh, Donut Economics. And if you were watching the film as well this morning or earlier on, uh, perhaps make some comment about the film as well. So you, you've got two minutes. Uh, and I'm going to take, if we've got five people with their hands up, I can't see any hands up at all just at the moment. I did see one hand up earlier. No, nobody's got any hands up. Perhaps nobody wants to speak. Oh, there we go. Uh, Jason Johnson had his hand up first, followed by Stuart Redaway. So, Jason, you've got two minutes. You will get cut off by Karen if you're longer than two minutes. Jason, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, for me, the, the, my first point is reduce, reuse, recycle. What, what, can, what can we do in terms of, in terms of using, our, using our bins that the council provide because I've noticed that where I, where I live, because I live in a situation where people aren't recycling and they're just throwing all the rubbish into the bin, into, into the black bin. And it's not good, you know, and we should be using blue, brown and green. I don't know what sort of areas, what sort of, area, what sort of colours they are in your area. Perhaps it'd be good to know. But for me, reduce, reuse, recycle. Recycling is my pet hate, my pet thing that I want to get across. I want to be able to see at least one person in my household be persuaded to use the, the, bin, the, the bins that are designated for cardboard, plastic, general house and bottles, you know, and stuff like that. My second point is electric cars. How can they be, how can we use, how can we use electric cars? Electric cars can be used in a way that, that is driverless, and that's all I'm going to say, because I don't want to get cut off. <laughs> that's excellent. Well done, Jason. Uh, Stuart. If anybody's got any comments, can they comment comment on what I've just said? Okay, yeah, feel free to comment in the, in the comment box. Thanks, Jason. Stuart Redaway next, your two minutes. Oh, hi. Uh, I, came, I came across Donut Economics, and it was announced that Amsterdam had adopted it. But when I looked into it with respect to climate change, uh, it ignored transport outside the city. Long distance travel is a big source of greenhouse gas emissions. And Amsterdam in particular is right next to a very big airport. So that gave me some doubts. I don't know if anyone can square that circle or whether donut economics can reasonably be applied to uh, cities. Thanks. Okay, Stuart. Thank you very much. Um, that was less than two minutes, so we might get we might get six people in or seven people in. Tom Harney, next. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. I'm struggling with my iPad, which I don't really understand, but pretend I do all the time. I did watch the film earlier on, and um, the only comment at the moment I'd like to make is that. I felt that right at the end was what was to me the key issue, which wasn't dealt with, and that is how we have a political system that actually delivers what people want in the sense that, from my point of view, having been, a, having been it's sort of, um, I'm not now, but I was a councillor in this area in Wirral for 20 years, and people had very definite ideas about recycling, about sustainability and so on, but they felt, as I feel now that I'm not a councillor, I'm probably one I was, that in fact the ability to influence what's going on was very, very limited. And I think that in fact the reality is that ourselves and the United States have been looked, at, looked up to by all sorts of people around the world as illustrated at Tiananmen Square, for example, when people were having uh, illustration of the Statue of Liberty, and also in Vietnam in the early days, when they, they hoped that um, 
the, the Americans would help them to be free because that's what they stood for. We influence the rest of the world, and yet I feel that we're not actually democratic ourselves, and it is time that we began to put a lot of effort into that because I feel glum about what's going to happen otherwise. And um, we will continue to um, support strange wars and um, the crisis that's to come, which definitely it is, according to the Sunday papers I've been reading, um, won't in fact um, be dealt with by any other means than in the end, austerity for the worst off. Thank you. Okay, Tom, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Fran Aborski, good to see you're in, Fran. I, I... Yeah, I finally managed to get in. Yeah, one of the things that really worries me is everybody going on about electric vehicles, which are absolutely not the answer, because rechargeable electric vehicles demand the use of lithium and other rare metals in their batteries, and those rare metals come from third world countries where there's a lot of exploitation. And the real future for transport is hydrogen power, here in Worcestershire, we've got Worcester Bosch working on it. And we've also got a company that is German owned, but also in Reddit. And in Germany, they are trialing hydrogen powered refuse trucks now. But I think we've got to, wait, got to get away from the idea that electrical vehicles are the answer because of their reliance on stuff like lithium and the problems that causes in the third world countries where it's mined and get over to hydrogen powered technology, which is actually clean technology which you honestly cannot claim that uh, electric vehicles are thank you fran that's very kind and i'll come to helen next hi everyone um uh, just a couple of points on the economic side of things uh, a long long time ago i studied economics at university uh, a nice point people can mention with GDP, it was already picked up in the film, that somehow this wealth seems to be going to only 1% of the world population. Uh, so therefore, saying that the current economic system isn't working very well should convince 99% of us. Um, uh, on the question of GDP being a very poor way of calculating things, uh, and thinking, oh, well, growth means we must be getting better off. Um, it's not a a well-known factor that crime is incorporated in GDP. So for instance, during the lockdown, if everything was stable, but we had a crime spree amongst the drugs community, our GDP would have gone up. And I don't think a lot of people know that it's all kinds of activity, including criminal activity, that gets taken into our GDP. So that's not a good indicator either. Thank you very much. That's uh, an interesting pointer to GDP not being very good. Yeah. We've got time for one more two-minute <laughs> contribution before we go back to the panel. Brian, Matthew, next. Keith, um, well, if we want to live in the safe part of the donut, we need a taxation system that works for that. And um, the best one that I've seen is, is, is what is being pushed by the citizens' climate lobby. Um, I did raise this at the last Lib Dem conference in the autumn. Um, and the simple idea is that you have a dividend, a carbon dividend, which everybody gets, and you have a carbon tax. And that helps the people, if you like, at the bottom, because they have uh, an added, almost like a citizen's income, which allows them to, 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 to pay for the essentials. Um, and everyone else, well, including, including them, everyone that's using carbon then has to pay the carbon tax. That's the way to change behavior. As, as uh, Bill Vinson said, it's the economy, stupid. We've got to be serious, and I think this would be a really good policy for us to adopt going forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, we will come back to um, a democratic set of discussions, uh, but I do just want to come back to the panel specifically on some of the points that have been raised. Uh, what I'd like to pick up on first is this uh, issue of intergenerational and intragenerational transition and fairness and equity and the fact that one percent of the population seems to own most of the rest of the most of the rest of the finances. Um, uh, I would like also to talk about um, universal basic income. I don't know whether Simon, you're ready just to plunge in on universal basic income uh, uh, to start us off on this round 
of uh, talks from Happy the too. from the panel. Happy to. I don't know whether I'll get interrupted again, but we'll give it a go. We'll try not um, to interrupt you. <laughs> uh, I uh, I'm just looking at the discussions around land value tax and resource sharing and carbon taxes and saying what we need is the not just a carbon dividend but a resource dividend so all the resources that get used um, need to be taxed at the point of use at the initial point of use and that fed into a universal basic income so that there is that so the social foundation ring of the donut is put into place because the U, a UBI would eliminate a lot of those shortfalls in the social foundation it would provide people with the means to acquire all the things that they need and if you give people a political voice they can fight for the other things they need such as peace and justice and gender equality and social equality giving people the freedom to spend on those causes rather than struggling to find water food and energy and housing is the way to get the other causes up front and centre and solved. Um, at the moment, if you're struggling to put food on the table, you don't give a damn about climate change. Absolutely not. You just cannot find the time to care. Um, and um, we need to see universal basic income as a means to an end in providing that bottom level of the donut and allowing us to focus on the ecological ceiling and resolving that. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I think we do need just to think about, I don't know whether we can think about it uh, today and discuss it to, in depth today, but um, universal basic income ought to be thought of in terms of universal uh, population so it's an international it's a multinational thing yes we can introduce it in in Hull or Sheffield and see whether it works or not or we can introduce it in Norway and see if it works or not but really if you look at the donut uh, kind of presentation the people who are in the middle of the donut who are not being uh, provided with their basic income and their basic needs are generally not in this country. Of course, there are some whose basic needs are not being met. But the, the scale of the problem is multinational. And uh, the government's recent decision to move DFID uh, from being a separate entity and putting it into the Foreign and Commonwealth Office so that Boris can have his um, airplane painted and somebody can build a new royal yacht uh, is just beyond my comprehension i have to say um if i can just go back to uh, jane uh, and then mary for their thoughts on intra and intergenerational equity mary uh, that's jane i said first uh, yeah i've been fascinated by hearing some of the comments from the audience and one of the themes that many of you mentioned was the fact about how local government works and I think that's really critical in terms of this donut. What's interesting, and in terms of the film we've just watched, is it relies on people working much more locally. There was one point raised about international travel by Stuart Redway. It's almost like if we have that, that working properly, that we have these local communities and we have local sustainability, it's almost like maybe you don't need that um, international travel quite as much. And one of the things that is really connecting for me in this discussion is just how all the policies we've campaigned for as Liberal Democrats, all of us that go back sort of 20, 30 years as Green Liberal Democrats, they all come together into one model. So you haven't just got climate change in there, you haven't just got social justice, you haven't just got basic income, you've got everything there in one model. You've got food, you've got biodiversity, you've got oceans, you've got pollution, you've got equity in terms of gender equity, wealth equity, health, really important, income and work, housing and networks, people's political voices, all of those things come together in one model. And I think this is the key thing for this discussion is how we get everybody thinking 
on this same page and it's almost like we just need to start and get on with this in our own local communities and motivate others to do the same and do likewise and it's kind of like looking at, again like i said in the introduction how we move from where we are now like the a and how we move to b where we need to be in 2040. thank you and mary was next in making comment please I couldn't agree more with uh, everything that uh, Simon and Jane have just rounded up. Really excellent summary from, from Simon there. Sort of, you know, and I'd like to sort of start by expanding on that point that he sort of talked about. And I can see Jock's comments uh, in the chat, which is, is really illuminating. So resources taxed at the point of use uh, and funded into UBI. But it, and it is more than that. It is tax on the damage, depletion and destruction of those shared resources. So the polluter pays model, which again is something that we've always talked about, because if you are taking something that is a shared resource, because essentially none of us own the planet, none of us own there. We're, it's the stewardship principle. So and yet we have allowed a structure and a system, uh, a capitalist sort of economic system that has said it is okay for other people other individuals to own the very things that uh, we depend on to stay alive um, and I think that you know that is at the heart of it and it comes back to my point about who is responsible uh, and you know it's harsh but it's saying I'm sorry Anyone who believes in that free market principle, what you are believing in is a systemic, institutionalized, racist, sexist, disabled, disabling, classist structure because of all the embedded um, inequalities. And therefore that is anti-liberal democrat because we believe in being fair and there is no place for that in my politics. And this I, I realize is quite it's quite radical. I'm pushing it. And this is the first time I'm trying it. So, you know, I think we all have to take responsibility that we are not just busy on the journey to somewhere else. Because the comment I've seen in the chat before earlier was that it was about roots and shoots. If you are invested in your surroundings, if you have set down your roots, then you can begin those new shoots of new growth and new thinking. Okay, thank you very much indeed. So sticking with the panel, uh, uh, Jed, next if I may, if you want to come back on what was being said in the um, general discussion there. I think where we are is that people want to feel useful. So as a party, starting from a perspective of well-being, giving people money to do nothing at one end of the spectrum is simply going to entrench the sort of thing that we see where 25% of children leave school without proper literacy in the UK. Um, I'm, I'm wading into something called Total Rethink by David McCourt, who's a, um, a guy who's gone around the world trying to make change. And he said the average American child reads for about 10,000 minutes a year. And the average child in the Middle East and Africa doesn't. Um, so we, we have, um, at the bottom end, got to make sure that what we're doing is giving people hope and aspiration. But, you know, what we're doing at the top end to make that happen is how we do it. Um, uh, Mary's approach, I think, is, is um, and her anger and her annoyance at the patriarchy and the 0.1% um, ability to be able to control the media and control what's going on, I think is already beginning to be dissolved. And I think the per Katie is the person who's done it with divestment. Um, I was really pleased to see 24% of Barclays shareholders voting to divest Barclays um, loans and investment away from carbon-based investments. And the immediate aftermath of that must have been something in the boardroom because the first thing that's happened has been BP has um, decided that to get rid of all of their new major um, research um, uh, drilling projects. 
So I think what we've got is a situation where they're quite powerful voices in the boardrooms and we've got to encourage them. If we look at Paul Polson, for example, ICI, um, he set up uh, RE100, the renewable um, uh, uh, approach for major corporates. And given major corporates control, uh, you know, there may be 20% of the companies in total, but they're 80% of the things that happen around the world. And um, when, when we um, see individuals working with our mindset in those companies, working in human resources, training people to think like us, um, and we promote things like the Kate Raworth um, uh, donut economics approach, what we can do is we can change things. So for example, Fran um, uh, on on the lorry side, um, perhaps you're not aware, but not a million miles from us is River Simple. River Simple should by now have, uh, this is hydrogen cars, they should by now have the same money that Elon Musk has invested in the Tesla and they should be out on the road. And yet he's glorying, um, he was on, on uh, LinkedIn last week, gloating that he's just got another half million pounds. He needs five billion. So that's where we need to put our efforts. We need to put our efforts into the positive side because we want power and we won't get power unless we get 80% of the votes. And um, we need to have um, the sort of thing that says, why are we expanding airports? Why do we not stop expanding airports and make fast railways connect to the remaining airports so that people can travel long distances by rail instead of by air? And that's how you get people included. That's how everybody joins in. I muted myself. I do beg your pardon. Uh, thank you, Jed. Uh, Jason, you're next in line to make your comments, please. Jason Billing, uh, have we got you muted? No, fine, it's me. I'm muted. Right, I'd like to come back to what um, Tom Harney said about um, the ability to influence so I'm, I'm now sufficiently old to call myself middle class, middle aged, um, despite what my brain says first thing in the morning. And to me, it's about critical mass. When, when I first started giving a damn about the environment in my early 20s, everyone was called hippie or fringe or an eco warrior, as if it was a derogatory, well, it was a derogatory term. Um, when I first went vegetarian in my 20s, I was called the complete you know, sort of sandal wearing lunatic in the family. All of those ideas since then have become mainstream. We're not pushing at the closed door anymore. We're, we're, we're kind of pushing a bit of an open door. Um, and to me, it comes down to sort of people power, the whole thing about Greta Thunberg. The reason why she cut through where we haven't is she was from exactly the right demographic. She, she was one of that group of people that needed to hear something. They wanted to hear something. They, they've grown up as our children. If we, if we give a damn and we've been telling our children, and I think we can rest assured there are a lot more people out there who also care about this, but they're just not very vocal. And all of their children, all of our children have been brought up in a different world to where we were. And I think the time is actually right, which is why I said that the film we just watched was a beacon of hope because it's a what can be. And I say it comes down to critical mass. And the really, really good thing is you know, what Jed and others just said now about boards voting against carbon. Okay? Um, and I think one of the ways we can actually achieve what we want is we, we use the capitalist system to our ends. We subvert it from within. I've, I've got a graphic on screen. It's one I've had on my, the back of, back of my screen for a long time. It's about who owns which major brands. There are only 10 companies that own pretty much every brand that you and I buy. 10. So if we get everybody we know, everybody we know that, that invests in shares to move to brands that are more eco-friendly, they will, they will take notice. You know, hit them in the wallet, hit them in the boardroom. We, the only way to actually get the money the 1% to sit up and notice is to hit them where it hurts. We can shout on the street. We can go and protest outside their offices as much as we like, and they will just shut the windows and ignore us. 
But if we get into the boardroom, if we get into the shareholders meetings, and if we start to influence people to divest of, from them, they will, take, they will sit up and notice. Okay, thank you very much indeed. I'd like to come back to our audience now for some further input. Um, I have seen some hands up. Uh, some of them are people who have spoken already. So uh, forgive me for skipping over you just initially. Um, so more hands going up, please. The first person I can see who hasn't yet spoken, Dennis, Dennis Mollison. Uh, thanks very much, Keith. Um, I'm a vice convener of Scottish Green Liberal Democrats and chair of Liberal Democrats for Electoral Reform. We've got a session tomorrow evening in the conference. Um, my, my sort of summary of it is that there, there really is an opportunity. This, this, this pandemic crisis has given an opportunity. You know, we've got a Conservative government, which is this pretty almost introduced universal basic income for, you know, admittedly temporarily, but um, and has forgotten about the, t the alleged you know, the claim that we have to keep the national debt down and so on. They realize there are more important things. So you know, possibilities of change are in the air. Um, the cost of sorting climate change is actually about the same as the cost hit we're going to take from the pandemic. You know, why do we act on the one and not on the other? Well, it's obvious because one sort of dumps itself on our doorstep immediately, one's long term. And I do think this donut economics approach, which is essentially saying that what we should concentrate on is sustainable well-being. Well-being means concentrating not on GDP, but food, housing, work, health, education, and social justice, those kind of things. Sustainable means we can't do that and exceed what the planet can provide. And particularly, we've got to deal with climate change and the terrible um, dearth of biodiversity we're seeing. Um, as to the how, um, I think we need to, we need a double act. We need to be inclusive. We need to be cross-party. There's a real lesson to be learned from the United States in the 1980s. Nixon very nearly started taking effective action on climate change, but somehow the oil companies persuaded people that it was a cross, it was a, uh, it was a, an antagonistic party thing and it got locked down as the Republicans didn't want it and the Democrats did. And in the same kind of way, if we're not careful, dealing with climate change, going to a better way of doing things, could end up like the Brexit argument. We mustn't do that. We must try and get all sides of society on board. But, but of course, at the same time, we need to persuade people that as Liberal Democrats, we have a lot of the, the, the right values and answers, the, the community-based and not being dogmatic about public and private sectors, using the best of each one where it's appropriate. Um, and to, to kind of finish with a suggestion, which is looking at what the policy committee is suggesting for motions for autumn conference. I was really depressed because they think that the two big issues are things which by September will be looking backwards. If we haven't already got a policy on dealing with the current pandemic, and dealing with Brexit, where have we been for the last whatever? You know, we don't need new policy on that. Sure, we need our leaders to be active on those two issues, but we don't need new policy. What we need new policy on is looking forward. And I, I would like to suggest that the Green Liberal Democrats and, and could, could take a lead in presenting a, a, a sort of a big, a big scale looking forward framework motion, essentially suggesting donut economics and, you know, Looking, looking, and, and then looking at the implications on the, the big, under the big headings like food and housing and work and so on. Um, and the deadline for motions for conference is the 1st of July. It's not very far away. I was very conscious of that when you were speaking that we have got to get our ducks in a row, our house in very order, and our words onto paper. Or very willing to help if anyone's interested. Okay, thanks, thanks, uh, Dennis. I will keep you to that. Uh, the next name that I can see who hasn't spoken so far is John, John Medway. If we can go to John uh, next. You may be muted, John. John Medway, can you unmute yourself? That is, I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. 
Oh, uh, good. Yeah. Um, yeah. It seems to me that um, in some ways, uh, a lot of the things that Kate Rayworth says in Donut Economics go a little bit against, um, should we say, traditional uh, liberal philosophy. Um, our, the, the, the preamble to the the preamble to the uh, to our constitution talks about uh, free markets where possible, state intervention where necessary. Now, I don't think that is really consistent with uh, donut economics. Um, I think the relationship between markets and um, and the rest of society is much more complex than that. Um, we, we can't be saying that uh, you know, the NHS has to be privatized because it's possible to privatize it, free markets where possible. Um, the, uh, um, so I think we may find, uh, going into the broader party, we may find some pushback um, from that faction who talks about four-cornered liberalism, um, economic liberalism on top of social and forms of, of, of liberalism. Now, just one observation, we've got a little bit bogged down at times today with different technologies, hydrogen and things like that. Um, I think we have uh, an important role within the party to perhaps um, reorientate us towards a sustainable view of economics. Um, that's it. Okay, thank you very much, John. Uh, Matthew Hulbert is the next name that I can see who hasn't yet spoken. Matthew, next. Hi, <clears throat> thank you. Um, first of all, I really enjoyed the, the film earlier today. I thought it was really inspiring. I mean, I guess my overall impression would be, and I think I put this in the, in, in the chat, was that um, it, that was kind of portraying a, a potentially perfect world in 2040, and I just wonder how practical and pragmatic some of those potential solutions are and I think you know we all have our ideal view of, of, a, of a greener planet that we'd like to see but unless you can take the people with you uh, you might as well be talking to ourselves as we in fact are uh, this afternoon um, and my view is what works is what works um, and that actually in politics you have to take people with you to um, to achieve things um, and I was in the Greens uh, briefly that's the actual that's the Green Party and the reason that I left was because yep yeah, lovely people very idealistic but they just wouldn't accept when you said to them yeah but people may not want to live a hair, hair shirt life people actually quite like the modern world people are quite happy with 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 things not everyone of course and that's why we need to make the world fairer and greener and that's why i'm a liberal democrat but i i just hope that we can be the pragmatic greens and i think talk of you know um ending free markets etc mm, i'm not so sure about that okay uh stuart Redaway is the next hand that i can see stuart has spoken so briefly stuart if you would uh, yeah i was brief last time but i'll be brief again. you were indeed that is true um, I was delighted to see that Brian Matthew uh, was supporting a carbon tax and dividend. I'd just like to say that there is a session on this on the 30th of June in this conference uh, and that a policy motion will be discussed there uh, which will be submitted the next day. Uh, so you've got a chance to sign up for that as a Lib Dem uh, policy and we can discuss it on uh, Tuesday week. Uh, incidentally, the dividend can be viewed as a UBI, which other people have been talking about. But the main thing is Tuesday evening uh, discussion on carbon tax, uh, including the policy motion, which I hope a lot of people will sign up to. Thank you. Okay, eloquently brief again. Good, good for you, Stuart. Uh, Stephen Hesketh, I haven't heard from before, so I'm going to go to Stephen and then. Um I will take a couple of brief uh, additions from Brian and Jason and then move back to the uh, panel. Yeah, I, th I think th there is an interesting conversation that is partly related to uh, to those identity wars, the, uh, sorry, I forgot the word, the, what the, the uh, 
what's it between the left and the right? What's the word I'm looking for? Center. Uh, sorry? Center. No. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we're, um, the, the Trumps versus the rest of us. The, oh, anyway. Lib liberal versus authoritarian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. No. Spectrum? Right. no. But, but anyway, I'll, I'll get to my main point. I think there, there is an interesting question between the economic liberals and the social liberals, because I think that so that the economic liberals do have a view of the, the way I understand it, that they own the rights to things. So that once you've earned those things, that the, the yours and your family's forever. And I think a social liberal would take a different view, but I don't think it's necessarily, as, as Matthew fears, it's free markets against the state. As a liberal, I actually see this other way that we're going to empower communities and individuals. And so we're actually, you know, it was going to be workers controlling these things rather than the state and rather than big corporate multinationals. And if we've got SMEs in, uh, empowered and ordinary people, it's a win-win for the huge majority of the population so that's that's my okay. thought, thank you very much Stephen appreciate that uh, and then briefly Jason Johnson and then Brian Matthew and then we'll come back to the panel Jason if you would be fairly brief please fairly brief uh, two questions I'd like to put to the panel if I can Keith yeah. um, how can we make the donor access uh, understand easily understanding for people with disabilities and also universal basic income it needs to be available to everybody how how would the panel make this make this so if they can? Okay, thank you. Two uh, questions there. Um, I think we will try and answer those for you, Brian, Matthew, finally, and then we'll come back to the panel. Well, just briefly to say, wonderful news from Stuart that uh, there is going to be a a, a, a debate on on, on the thirtieth um, on the whole idea of the carbon tax and dividend. Um, and the, yes, the, the, the simplicity of the carbon dividend is that everybody gets it. Um, we, we've just been living through the most incredible time, really, um, despite the, the, the horrors of the pandemic. But the, the fact that so many people are using their bikes at the moment, and, and I think so many people want us to see us come out of this in a better way, um, especially with the environment coming forward. So this really is a great chance for us to capture the popular uh, imagination and that means a cross-party approach really this is something that we can drive but it needs to be cross-party in terms of its implementation thank you okay brian thank you uh right we've had a really wide-ranging discussion um where in the last well i was going to say quarter an hour we're in the last 12 minutes of of the session um doesn't time fly when you're having fun uh, what I'd like to do is to go back to the panel and in, in reverse order from the starting order. So that's going to be Jed, Jason, Mary, Simon and Jane in that order. Um, so coming to Jed first, your, your comments. One of the things I'd like to do perhaps in this last 10 or 12 minutes is for us to consider how we as the Green Liberal Democrats first can influence the party to be better educated about economics and down at economics. And secondly, how we should interact with the wider world. Should we only interact with the wider world through the party? Or is there a case for us becoming revolutionaries and non-violent direct action? I'll put that, pose that question for us to think about. So, Jed, to you. Right. Let's, let's, um, let's start on the revolutionary bit. And I think that uh, we've seen from Extinction Rebellion that it's very, very possible to very, very peacefully get people to think in a slightly different way. And the challenge they gave us was something impossible, the 2025 idea. Uh, 2025 is impossible because in and amongst the 24 hours of, of talks at last year's Green Lib Dem, Deb Fringe uh, uh, events um, at the conference, um, the, the people responsible for trees said we couldn't actually plant enough native species in the United Kingdom by 2025 in order to be able to create the canopy that would absorb carbon enough. So what we have to do, I think, um, as an organisation is to carry on doing what we're doing, listening very carefully to the science 
and translating it into policy that our MPs understand so that they don't go off on tangents by themselves before our conference. And when things are announced that are um, uh, major and ecological, they're actually announced, uh, uh, announced uh, on the floor of, and the platform of the Green Lib Dem conference. The way to do that is, I think, is to carry on as we're doing, leading by example. Many of us who are Green Lib Dems are also councillors, and I think that uh, by working in councils towards ensuring that every single council has as a working policy, um, besides health and safety, uh, besides personal safety, um, first, a climate um, uh, uh, climate positive. I think we've got to find a way of making it positive. Some positive outcomes, um, the usual treasury outcomes, eight pounds for every pounds we invest as a council, um, coming back into our local economy. So if that's that fantastic uh, Indian experience of locally generating and using energy, um, and besides the economic argument, the social argument as well, that says we are going to do something positive. And um, uh, uh, leading by example, um, uh, then goes into the schools and teaching. And I think we're in a very good position uh, as a party to uh, move this into the education with or without this useless government. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Jason, next. We've got uh, nine minutes left, so two minutes. No, we haven't. We've got eight minutes left, so you've got two minutes. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be very brief. Um, I, I, I think you're right. It's about are we in a bunker? Or are we talking with the outside world? Um, I would like us to use every thread and sphere of influence we can possibly have. Um, if we know councillors, talk to them, whether they're on our party or other parties on council, um, there will be a lot of like-minded on environmental and ecological issues, conservative, labor and other party councillors and non-party councillors. Every MP we know, every ex-MEP we know, talk to them, just have a conversation about why we are doing what we're doing. Because I think it goes back to the vision thing. They've got to understand why we're doing this because we have a vision. And if they can share our vision, I think we will start to influence from the core. Smashing, thank you very much indeed. Mary, next. Uh, I think it's been a thoroughly interesting, engaging and fantastic discussion. Um, thanks for all the speakers who've sort of made comments and the chat has been very illuminating. Um, you know, I found myself very much in agreement with Jock and Stephen and uh, Matthew, uh, even, and it's just that little sort of nuance of, of perspective always that uh, is disagreement. But in my campaign in Bristol, I work on the 1% theory, not the 1% richest, but I work on the 1% of agreement theory. If I can find 1% of agreement with another human being, that means I can start a conversation. And what we are developing now is a way to have very difficult conversations about the inherent inequalities uh, that are embedded within the structures in our society and within other cultures and others. Uh, other societies because it's on, on all the edges of that intersectionality where we find that one person's sort of uh, you know ownership of of resources can really really impact and disempower uh, somebody else so to look at jason's question about how do we enable people with disabilities in particular uh, to understand uh, some of these uh, issues and, and concepts we have to devise, devise and design all of our systems, our, our living systems, everything um, to enable the most disempowered and the most disadvantaged. And if we do that, we then achieve equality and parity and equity for, for everybody else. And finally, that, that point, my, as I, my start point was I come from a branding background. So uh, branding is important. Um, and if we are in the bunker or whether we're talking to ourselves, we have to find a way to cut across the public inertia 
that actually even myself included on some days would rather be watching TikTok videos of the nurses doing the dancing or cats do the funniest things. We have to find a way to get new messages across to different audiences and speak to them in their language. And that is the points that were talked about with Greta um, talking to a younger generation. And this film itself will cut across and talk to so many different people in different ways. But this isn't the end. It's only the beginning because there will be the next translation needed because change ultimately without revolution will have to be evolution. Uh, and therefore that is a slower process of change. Thank you very much. That sounds like a, an encouraging suggestion that we should show the film during the autumn conference uh, or before the autumn conference, preferably, so that people get an idea of what we, we're about. Uh, who's next? Simon's next. And uh, in case you didn't see the comment that he made in the chat room recently, talking about bunkers, Jason... Um, Simon was suggesting that we get a job building the bunkers. Uh, defend that if you can, Simon. <laughs> um, well, apart from anything else, if we're the ones building the bunkers, we can build tunnels between them and communication between them. Um, but, uh, I'll give you that one. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to talk about was the democratic aspect. Um, one of the things that the Lib Dems are known for is going on about PR about people's voices and people who are unheard and a key element i think of this donut economics model is the the voice because in order to be a functioning member of society you have to have access to a voice and i think that's what we can offer people we can go to the people who currently have very little voice and offer them a voice um, and i think if we focus on that, then we'll grow a movement. That sounds a good idea, growing a movement. Jane, you want to grow a movement as well? We've lost Jane. I'm now unmuted. Ah. <laughs> ah. So this session for me, I've really enjoyed the whole discussion. I want to pick up on Keith's challenge about um, where we are. Are we revolutionary or evolutionary? To me, I think the Green Liberal Democrats are the ultimate recyclers of policy because a lot of this does go back 20, 30 years from where we began. 40 years. Yeah, but actually it's got a new freshness to it with the donut economics and the new voices, the Greta Thunbergs, the young people who are now speaking out, the Black Lives Matters. And it reminds me a little of the dual approach to politics, which some of you may have heard of before. So the dual policy approach is similar to the point Jason made so it means you work within the system within the political structures that we've got be it local government be it national political systems or you work outside and that's more like the Black Lives Matters protests the climate change protests so you have to work with both I think what I like most about the model is the fact that it's all encompassing so it brings in people with disability it brings in um, gender balance it brings in minorities it brings in equity of wealth and equity of resources it brings all that in into one overarching policy that's something new as far as i can see it's a holistic way i think politics has suffered by being very reductionist in the terms it separates out food and health policy from climate change and economic and carbon policy actually public health dimension and our health and well-being is very much driven by the same forces as climate change and the fact that we have lack of biodiversity and we're under the weight of covid all these things linked together so for me part of this going from a to b that we've talked about we're 2020 being a we're going towards 2040 it's about moving to be part of the solution and not part of the problem and i think that goes back to the point about how we all change and how we look to ourselves and how we each influence within our sphere of influence and i think sometimes as green liberal democrats we can kind of feel like we're, we're empowered at this but actually there's so much more and I think we all have to go out there into our communities as local councillors and we need to be part of the solution and no longer be part of the problem. Thank you very much indeed. My clock on my computer is showing 15.59 so by the time I finish speaking it will have ticked over to uh, the end of the, it's just gone, 1600. Uh, we've got to the end of the meeting. 
I think that was a fabulous session, uh, and I don't think we missed anybody who wanted to speak. I, I don't think we uh, avoided uh, people speaking who uh, people not speaking who wanted to say something. Um, the frustrating thing, of course, is that this is only a discussion between 50 people, uh, and we really need to be speaking to 50 million people if we're going to make our voice heard. Uh, and make it effective and one of the problems I see is that we've got a conservative government who may well be uh, it depends on electoral mathematics but I suspect they may well be in power for the next four or five years and somebody made the comment yesterday that um, if we have to waste the next four or five years before we actually come to some of the solutions the solutions are going to be four years more difficult okay um, before I formally close the meeting, I've got a couple of things to say. One is that I meant to mention at the beginning of the meeting about the photo competition. Kevin Dawes said there's a new challenge. So any people who are at all photographically minded and who want to uh, air their cultural capabilities, if they would like to go to the website and see what the competition is all about, you can submit uh, pictures during the course of this week that will be voted on by, or judged by the uh, by the by Kevin and uh, Martin Horwood at the end of this week and so do do look that up if you're interested in photography and the other thing of course is to say that we've got a really 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 big session uh, in a couple of hours time with Jane Goodall uh, somebody made the comment right at the beginning you were we were lucky to get Jane Goodall I tell you, it wasn't a matter of luck at all. We, we had to try very hard, and I'm, I'm absolutely delighted she's coming. So if you don't know who Jane Goodall is, can you spend at least a few minutes in the next couple of hours looking on Google and finding out how important she is? And um, I think that's the end of the meeting, folks. And can people share the details of Jane Goodall so we sell some more tickets before then? Get new members. Very practical. Okay, thanks Karen and Alison for facilitating all of that. Have a break. I think we can probably sit in the room and have a chat if you like now. Uh, and uh, we can also go and make a cup of tea if we don't want to sit and have a chat. So I'm actually going to close my screen down <laughs> and I should... hand over to Karen. And I'll turn my mic on. Yes, I just want to remind people that this evening's session is going to be in the conference hall, not in the meeting hall. So make sure you look in your conference manuals to just get the right link so that you're going to be in a session where you can all put questions in the Q&A feature, which we've got there. And so I very much look forward to seeing uh, you turning up as little participant numbers in the conference hall. But until then, until five o'clock, uh, this space will be open for chats. Likewise, the other breakout rooms are also working.